Hello, my name is Richard Cox. I'm here again today with Tim Freak on what we've decided to call a series of Deep Awake Dialogues. It was either that or the Tim and Richard show, but we couldn't decide between the Tim and Richard show or the Richard and Tim show, so we went for Deep Awake Dialogues. So in this, the third episode of Deep Awake Dialogues, I'm going to be asking Tim about his career as an author. Um, Tim, good morning. Good morning. You've written, I don't know what it is, 25 books? More. Uh, do, you, do you know the exact figure? No. Okay. Well, it's a lot. Anyway. It is a lot. And you started in your mid 30s, I think, with the Dowdy Jing? Yeah. So, was being an author something you always aspired to do, or was it something you fell into at that point in life? Ah. <sighs> kind of both and neither I suppose um, uh, it, it's interesting when I look back because I feel like I was always a writer um, I at school the the I had an amazing experiences around teachers of English who would come and pick me out and and you know I remember one when I was I don't know, 15 or something coming up afterwards and saying, look, if you want help publishing some of the things you write, I'll help you. And me thinking, oh, that's nice. <laughs> so I always had that background in writing um, as, as something which um, clearly people could were pointing me towards. And it, and it interests me that after the experience that I had of awakening when I was 12, um, which I've talked about a lot, uh, what I did was I wrote. I wrote a play. And we performed it. It was a big deal, actually, in the local community because it was all kids. And so I immediately turned to writing. Um, and then not got distracted, but I think, but, but saw, got very attracted towards music because music has this power to instantly change consciousness and because its power in society is so large. I was very attracted towards that ability it had and the impact it was having and, and being young and, and, and so really got pulled into that as a medium. I also think there was a moment where I knew that I would end up doing what I've been doing, not just writing, but being a, a philosopher or, or specifically exploring awakening and didn't feel up it, didn't feel I could do that, that I wasn't ready and I wasn't ready. Um, and so writing was something that needed to wait because I was ready to make music. I could make music about awakening, if you like. I could write music, which was about consciousness changing, and I could do that, but I couldn't approach writing. So writing kind of disappeared off into the back of my mind and my focus and my creativity was on sound. Um, and then really life came and got me. I was doing a very big uh, rave show, uh, a shamanic theatrical rave show with a ridiculous cast of huge number of people and, and giant puppets and video which was pretty new then and um to bring about you know with music and visuals and and it, and i poured a huge amount of energy into it and it had been a great success and then gone nowhere and i was exhausted and i realized i had to stop that i'd come to the end of the road i'd been at it for a very very long time we'd been so close so many times to making it work in the way it would be sustainable it was working so i kind of backed off and a friend of mine was a writer um and he had an agent and he said uh, tim you're a writer you should write and he's a bit older than me and i thought well maybe and uh Anyway, for various other reasons, I was put in touch with this, this agent. And I thought, what have I got I can send to her that I've written? Because I haven't written anything for years. I mean, I'd written a lot when I was younger. And, and I'd, had, I'd actually had a play put on the radio when I was younger as well, just as an incidental. But um, the, the, what was the way life works, you know, it was like I was knocking on this door, I, music I want to create. Behind me, there was an open door marked writer. Um, and I just kind of turned around and wandered back through this other door. And I just thought, what have I got to send to her? And what I had was I've been writing my own version of the Tao Te Ching. And I've been doing that to set it to music because I was fascinated by sound and word. And so I, I, I couldn't find a translation that worked for me because I've been studying the Tao Te Ching since I was 15. I knew it inside out. And I wanted to, it to say what I, I knew it, that I felt it was saying. So I was also hanging out and had been with people like Robert Bly, who, like Coleman Barks, had taken the works of these great poets, Rumi and, and um, uh, uh, Kabir and these, these mystical poets, 
and transliterated them. They weren't translations. They weren't going back to the original language. They were working from translations, but bringing out what it really meant. And so I did that with the Tao Te Ching and worked from like, you know, 30 different translations and really worked out, no, this is what it's saying and presented this and, and sent it to this agent. And it arrived literally on her desk at the same time as another letter from a publisher saying, we want to do a series of Chinese one who can do a copy. And she took my copy. She sent it to Martin Palmer at Manchester University, who's the top Chinese expert in the country. And he looked at it and said, this is great. This is great. So he oversaw me doing the translation. And the next thing I knew, I was a writer. And then, bang, I was off. And the agent was there going, can you write about Zen? And I was like, yeah, I can, actually. I'm well, still um, there's a kind of progression in your writing, as I notice. Um, because I, I um, for people that don't know, I spent some time over the past year turning Tim's books into eBooks, uh, which we had to do right from the, the process of scanning them. So um, I'm quite familiar with them at this point. And there is this progression from- <laughs> More so than me, I suspect. I, yeah, I'm probably, yeah. I, I've, uh, I've, I've read them all at this point, I'm proofread them all. So, <laughs> um, so there's this, this progression from starting off in the 90s where you do things that are very much commenting on existing philosophies like Zen or Hinduism, or writing things like the Tao Te Ching and doing books that are, um, involve a lot of quotations and a lot of commentary and drawing out the meaning of what other people are saying. And then there's a, a progression to in the, the mid part of the last decade, say, where your writing becomes very original when you've got books like um, The Laughing Jesus, which incorporate like a third of it is your own thoughts. Um, and, and then going to How Long Is Now, which is, you know, a, a sort of biographical book. Was that a, a good way to progress in terms of um sinking into being a writer that you've almost got like this support you're not having to be totally original straight off the bat yes for me it was great and, and also i mean it's so original it's so so individual isn't it you know the whole journey we make but for me i did so I'd, I'd immerse myself in spirituality all my life so i knew this stuff inside out so um and it was at a particular time where there was a great rush of spiritual books so i could actually make a living writing books on these different traditions. So I had the delight. It was like, oh God, I can, so I can literally go, I want to write about this and then go do write about these, all these different traditions, bringing out the perennial philosophy of oneness in them. Um, and so it was, it was a delight, but it was also, so in one way as a creative artist, that was like, and as a spiritual explorer, that was like, oh really? So it forced me to go, so what's, what's the essence of Zen? So what's the essence of Sufism? So what's the essence of this? And that was, a fantastic discipline but also for me on my own individual journey as a musician it had all been about my own vision my vision my vision my vision my vision and i hadn't made it work and it felt like there was me in the world and we were like you know it was like being at the school disco and and i and i was on one wall and she was dancing in the middle and i was like no you come to me no you come to me no you come and eventually it was like no i gotta go to her so it was like uh, what i did was i just kind of went okay i will write at the stuff which isn't to do with me it's my vision of what these different traditions are but this is not just about me this is me providing a service for for other people and i will also work with publishers who want this and want it in this format and like pictures and you know and all these things which maybe i don't want and so it was a it was a compromise i compromised and i started making a living properly because in that way and what was fascinating for me was that having come to terms with that and being able to do it then from that i arrived at the position where i could actually do what i think i was born to do which was create my own ideas and, and write them but I needed to go through that. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I've heard it, um, this is an aside to the interview, I've heard it said like that a lot of spiritual art through the ages has, um, the artist hasn't had total freedom. Like if you think of ancient Egypt, there's all this incredible spiritual art there, but it's totally conformist to a standard yeah. 2,000 years. There's like no deviation, well, one little period. Um, and people like um, Michelangelo or someone paid in the Sistine Chapel, had those great works, but they were done to the order of someone else. And so it's, it's true through the ages, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's something about, I needed to be willing to, uh, certainly humility perhaps, mm. and, a, and, and a kind of, um, not, yeah, just a right of transition. 
um, and, and so that's how it worked for me. So that when I hit those books that you're talking about, then I had a platform and then it was like, okay, I'm ready now. Let's go. And then you know, that, that's where I wanted to be. And now, and now that's just continuing and the work I'm doing now, it's like, I can't believe how lucky I am to m make a living mm. exploring the philosophy of life and getting to write about it like I am right at this very minute. Okay, so I want to ask some questions that are perhaps useful to people who aspire to write something but get very stuck with that. I know that's my experience whenever I've tried to, to sit down and write. So just to start with, Tim, you're, you're writing a new book at the moment. I'd just like to ask, first off, what, what kind of structure do you have for putting a book together, assuming it's the same every time, and it might not be, um, but do you have um, an idea in your mind of the, the whole book? before you begin and know roughly what the chapter headings are going to be or is it very much an emerging process does the book look very different by the time it goes to the publishers from what you initially thought it might i like usually i start with if there's a vision there's an idea that i i know i want to explore and there's something which is pushing in on me it you know it really something wants to be said and because I know now how much work it takes. There's a little bit of resistance in me. It's like, you really want to be said? Because <laughs> I've got to be committed to this because it's going to take a lot from me. And then it's about trying to work out what that is. And part of that for me is to structure things. What are the elements of this idea? And how would I explain it? And narrative, I think, is essential. In, if, you're, if you're doing something which is about explaining something. Um, it's quite different, I think, to fiction and things. But narrative in that explaining sense, because often what you want to convey is something you, you, you intuitively know, but it's a total thing. It's a bit, like, <clears throat> a bit like if I tried to describe this room to you, what I want to do is go, it's like this. Mm -hmm. But I've got to go, if I've only got words, I've got to go, well, let me start by the window. The window's like this. And then you go to the right, there's the door. And then if you come around, there's the bookcase. Or, or should I go, and opposite the book, you know, how do I, where's the, so, so when you're dealing with ideas like I am, the key thing is to work out how, how can I come in? How can I find a strand to touch the reader where they're going to be with me and then feed them something which they'll come with? They'll go, yeah, I get that. And then something else, oh, I get that. And we're going here, we're going to, in my case, we're going often to things which are really woo, but we've got to get there. So, you know, each step, they have to come with me. They have to come with me. They have to come with me. And so work out that narrative is important. And also because often you can't say this until you've already said this. You know, if I want to talk about in the state of lucid living, there's, you know, synchronicities happen. Well, you need to know what lucid living means and you need to know what synchronicity is. So before that, I need to have worked out those things. So that, there's that kind of logic to it. So uh, another question I wanted to ask related to that was, when you're writing, who do you visualize your writing for? Um, because I know when we first did these interviews, you said it's a lot easier to talk when you've got someone there in front of you on the camera on Skype or whatever than it is just to talk to a camera because it's relational. Okay. And I notice uh, whether it's writing for an audience, it's much easier to write a letter than it is to write um, uh, something that's for a general audience, I find, because I know who I'm relating to. And I can think, well, will this person understand this? I know what their vocabulary is, what words they'll get and what they don't. But if I'm yes. writing for a load of yes. people, some people know what lucid living means, other people don't. Some people know um, all sorts of spiritual vocabulary, others don't. Um, so how do you balance that do you visualize your writing for a particular person or at different times or what do you how do you do that yeah i mean i think one of the good things about that the 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 process i went through of writing a lot of those early books was that i realized i was writing for a general readership which is really going look i'm this is a i want this to reach everyone um and so it is tricky i mean if you look you know, if, if, if someone has read the, the mystery experience, so they go to quite near the beginning of that, where I'm kind of, I know we're on a long journey because it's a big book. So I spent a whole, I don't know, section of the book going, hey, this is, if you're like this, there's going to be this. And if you're like, you know, if you're into the intellect, there's going to be lots of thoughts. If you're into feelings, we're going to do this. If you're a scientist, I'm going to talk about science. If you're a mystic, I'm going to talk about, because I'm wanting to bring everyone in. 
Um, other books, you know, like this one I'm writing at the moment, there's, I will write this now. What, how am I thinking? I'm thinking I'm writing it because with a, a general sense of people, but I'm also going, but if you're not into philosophy, don't come with me because this is going to be philosophy. I'm not going to make any, you know, this, this is not going to be ABC. This is going to be deep. And I want to, but my job, I always feel, is to, make, is to know what I'm saying so clearly that I can make it clear enough that anyone or most people have a good chance of going, oh, I actually get it, uh, rather than... Right, uh, right. I, I remember you saying to me once, you were talking about another writer um, who writes spiritual books, I won't, I won't name him, um, but you said he's a very clever man, uh, but he's not a very good writer because he lets his audience, his readership know how intelligent he is when he writes. And a good writer lets the readers know how intelligent they are. And I think um, in your work, uh, you do make concepts very accessible, like a book like Jesus and the Goddess about Gnostic texts. Gnostic texts are famously inaccessible. You can't understand what they mean. And it would be very easy to write a book like that, which was equally inaccessible. And yet what you and Peter Gandhi did in that was made a, a book on Gnosticism, that a general audience um, could read. I mean, I was about 20 when I read that book and I could, I could follow it. So, um, how did you develop that style of accessibility and were, were there people or other writers that influenced you in that, or was it something that came about over just having been involved in writing for so long? Wow. What a great question, Richard. I, whew, I mean, it's very important to me. And I do think that I think like most people, when I, used to read books if i didn't understand them i thought i'm not clever enough now i just think the author's not writing well enough uh because the author you know, or, or it's just not for me i mean if i'm writing a book on advanced quantum physics then it's fair enough that i don't understand it because i need to put in the few years of work to get to that point but if it's a book aimed at the general reader then very often it's not oneself that's being stupid it's the writer who's not really conveying the ideas they think they know what they're saying but they don't really know what they're saying so i think it came out of my training at philosophy at a university what, what i loved about that i mean i did it was western philosophy really i mean most people find it very dry and um and very narrow but what it did was it made me appreciate clarity of thought and the power of doubt and the ability to really go What's this person saying? What am I saying? You know, just homing in. Doubt to, so I spend an enormous amount of time questioning my own ideas. And what that does is it helps me sharpen up the idea. And I'm, I won't rest until I find a way of saying it in a way that captures it, I feel, in a way that's accessible. So, for instance, Lucid Living was, I mean, what I, was, I knew I wanted to write a book about the very essence of the mystical experience. And I knew I wanted it to be short. But I'd written 30,000 plus words and, and in an attempt. I was, I was in, it was, I'd gone to Ireland to write it. I had a flat in Ireland by the sea under the mountains of Morn. And thing, how can I send stuff, quotes from Zen masters and all sorts of things. That'll help throw that in a bit of that. And then just despaired and threw it in the bin and just thought, this is garbage. Um, and, and literally in the bin just went, what's that paragraph there? and pulled out this line and there was a paragraph which just said that the the awakened state is compare it seems to me it's comparable to lucid dreaming it, it's like lucid living and I, that's it that's it. the whole thing is there that's it that conveys everything how you can be in the dream and not in it the whole you can be all one and all many everything was in and, and but it took all that time to find that and then this tiny little book could come out in which I could just, but I knew that's where I was going. Mm -hmm. So part of it for me is to go, no, that's not it. And be willing to pick up three months work and throw it in the bin. Go, that's not good enough. Do you find that's been your experience of writing that you have these phases of like writer's block, if you like, where you just, you put loads down and then it's all scrapped. And because, I mean, obviously when you approach a book now, you know, you can write a book because you've done it 25 times or thereabouts. So, um, but I think it's, um, it can also be overwhelming for people just to, to hit this wall where they're trying to get out what they want to say and they can't quite. Um, so do you, I mean, you've just described an example where you do, but is that, is that a, a part of every book you write that you will have periods of frustration and trying to overcome that? And how do you? I get stuck. 
you know, I will, I will get stuck um, with concepts. And in this present one, for instance, I'm trying not to write. I'm really pushing it. How long can I, can I wait before I start writing? Because what I don't want to, what I, what I find in the past often is I'm working on an idea and then there's something, there's like chapter three. Yeah, it's about that. It'll make sense when I get there. And then I get to chapter three and it doesn't make sense. And then suddenly it's like, oh God, how do I get through this? Or I get to chapter seven and realize that should have been chapter two. And then I've got to move it around. And then you've got all of this chaos that, that comes out. And a lot of writers get that. And that's a part of the process. I'm trying to avoid it with this one by really thinking it through first. So I can, and part of it, I think, is that, you know, if you get stuck, it, uh, it's valuable to have people to talk to because we're talking now. And, and in that interaction, sometimes it's easier to find the thoughts than when you're just sitting on your own. Mm. So it's good to, you know, good to remember. For me, here's a, here's the thing. I, and I say this very consciously in a lot of my books. At the beginning of the mystery experience, I, I quote Walt Whitman um, to try and get this across. I, when I write, I want the reader to feel like I'm writing to them because I am. Mm -hmm. It's not just them. Obviously, I'm reading right for all these, but I am also writing just for them. I want them to hear my voice. I am saying to them, look, I, there's something of value that I'm willing to com commit all of this time and effort into saying to you. And I want you to hear it's me. It's not just words on a page. It's not a book you downloaded or you bought. It's Tim. Tim is talking to you about his experience of being a human being alive on this mysterious journey of life. And, and so there's that kind of connecting through. I forgot your question now. I got carried away by connection. But that, 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 yeah, having someone to connect with so you can find the thoughts. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's... Um... So did you enjoy having a co-writer then in, um, in Peter Gandhi or having people around that you can... I have, to have, I have to have someone around always. That's really interesting. When, when, when I don't have a uh, co-writer, there's always somebody uh, that I can trust, who I feel knows what I want to say, and who will have the honesty to tell me when it's, what works and what doesn't work. And... Uh, I need that. I have to have that. No, that's, that's, I don't, I don't think really, that would be obvious. Not all through the process, though, Richard. Not, it's not like always all the way through, but at key points, I want to be able to go, Does this, is this working? This is what I want to try and say. That's, that's really interesting. I don't think that would be, um, it certainly wasn't obvious to me because I could visualize yourself or writers going into their office, locking the door, and it just, and then I think it's, um, if that's a person's image of what a writer does and they try and replicate that and it doesn't work then um because you need a more relational energy to be able to create something it's, it's very helpful i think to know that yeah because i tell you what it is it's that you know you can try and work it out on your own and sometimes you know but sometimes you don't know and then you can waste an awful lot of time does that work is that paragraph working mm. I, i've got that little joke at the end there is that funny or does that just make me sound like an idiot if you have someone you trust it takes you a second they can just look at it and if they go no it works you go okay it works if they go, no, oh, that makes you sound like an idiot. He's just, I'll cut that. And, and that ability, but it needs to be someone you trust who, who can mm -hmm. help you move into that. That's, that's really what an editor should, editor should be. What, what an editor is in the modern age isn't that. We, we, you know, publishing is, 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 in, is a mess. Editors now are people you don't know. They come in, they mess with your books. They, you know, they, they, they correct the grammar to their style. It's the, I don't like it. What an editor should be is someone who's there going, hey, Richard, I, I hear your vision. Let me help you get that vision onto the page. That's what okay. I should be. So, so that, that's one pole of the kind of creative question in terms of um, having someone to relate to in the world. But you're writing about uh, the mystical experience in these inner states of consciousness so how does sinking into that, um, what role does that play in your creative process and writing? I'm not someone who goes, yes, I come in the morning, I meditate for an hour, and then I can write. Uh, it's not like that for me. I don't know anyone who's that, that actually who, who, who does that. There might, probably are people, but... Um, Partly because the, there's something about meditation for me which is very still. Uh, so I'm more likely to just still everything right down and just be happy in the moment. Um, I'm more likely to do, you know, like, like Tai Chi or something like that will often stimulate ideas. Again, you know, once you get 
it, it, it's really, well, it's just different for every, every, all the time. For, what I don't feel is that there's some sort of correlation between spiritual practices and creativity. Often okay. creativity will be frenzy. You know, a lot of my books have been like possessed by like, just working through the night and, and, um, and, and, and a little bit crazy. Uh, and there's a craziness to the creative process I actually love. I mean, I do, I do love it when suddenly it's just like you're in another world. And I do get, it, there, is a, there is that definitely that of entering some, some other state where you are, especially when you're really in, in the process, holding a whole book in your imagination is like being nine months pregnant. I mean, it's just, well, I don't know what that's like, obviously I'm a man, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, whew, gotta, I'm, I'm carrying this huge thing. Um, and it's tough, and that's tough for people around me because I'll come into the kitchen to make a cup of tea, and and Debbie or my kids will want my attention, and I'm like, no, don't, don't, no, just leave me. I'm just making tea, and I just, I'm holding this thing. Don't make me put it down, and uh, and I and I need to stay with it and and get it out. Um, so there's that much more like that than it is like, mm, yes, I'm writing these words. It's, it, there's serenity is in the background the serenity is where it comes from what what but what comes out is this kind of passionate creativity yeah that, well, that's interesting because what i'm getting at here is what i find um when i'm writing something is that i'll put words down and put words down and look at them and not be happy with them and not be, and i'm writing from the concepts that are in my mind and when i sink within more and feel out how do i really feel about this concept what language would i put it in that's comfortable for me then that's what i want to say on the page so that's what i'm i'm trying to get at about the, the inner thing coming through yes absolutely so so my point earlier is don't confuse that with um right it's not like, don't confuse those two but yes the deepness the sinking back into the self what is creativity there's two things happening in this moment there's this there's the there's the meeting of everything which has come before which is repeating itself and this this other this newness this possibility the more conscious we are, the more creative we are. Simple as that. But don't confuse that with certain spiritual mm. assumptions. But, it, but definitely, creativity for me comes from the depths of my being. So if I'm creating on the surface, it feels mm. predictable and rigid and repetitive and where I've been before. But if I sink back, there's a tenderness to it. There's a directness. There's a risk-taking. I'm startled by it. It all comes from that. And, and also for me, more than that, I spend an awful lot of time giving things over to my depths. So when I'm working on an idea and I can't work out how to answer it, I just let the question sink into the depths of my being and wait. So I do that a lot. So I'll, I, it's like, well, how does that? And, and then it'll go back. And then at some point over the next day or a week or mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. or sometimes years, bang up it will come and then ah 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 that lovely feeling you know that feeling of oh 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 this is good i don't know what it is but i know it's good hang on uh, oh i'm trying you know and and there's that feeling yeah i, I heard you give an example once actually about um an analogy to looking of a deepening of um perspective say um and the, the example you gave was like right now um all i can see is my hands and yet, paradoxically, I can't actually see my hands. Whereas if I, if I move my perspective, um, then I get a different view of, of my hands. I could see my hands in both places, but in a very different way. And that's what it feels like to me of sinking back into consciousness. You gain a, you move further away from the issue, almost, of what you're trying to create and can gain a more holistic perspective on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in that way, it's absolutely in integral. And so you're, you really come out and then it is, there it is all laid out and you can see, you can see what it is. It's, and it's, it is like, like watching something, like watching something pour out often. Like, oh, there it is. Now, not, not in the sense that, you know, everything's paralogical for me. So there's a create and there's a criticize involved in writing. There's a, there's a, like, like, you know, two steps so that the create is sink back let it pour out the ideas and that's a very spontaneous um intuitive process and then there's another aspect which often will come in later 
sometimes they come together, but often that's later, which is more critical, more really does that work? Um, mm -hmm. Is that the best way of saying it? Should those come around the other, you know, should I put those sentences the opposite way around? Is that better? Does that? And then there's a different part of me that will come in. And there's a constant dance between those two, I think. We need both, but we don't need, we, we don't certainly want the critical one to dominate. A lot of people freeze because they've got the critical one on already. Mm -hmm. You've got to turn that one off. You've got to yeah. dance in the moment. Well, that was my final point, actually, because I think there's a lot in um, modern self-development spirituality about getting rid of the critic, right? And an interesting thing about taking a, a dualistic or paralogical view, say, is that both of these halves of creative, critical, are necessary components of our, our being. Yes. It's yes. just when we don't recognize that, one can go totally out of balance or it's suppressed and you don't know the critic's there and then suddenly it rages up and will shred your work for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need both. Of yeah. course you do. But what you don't need is to let the... Yeah, you know, it's like when I'm with my kids when they're little. I know what I just... And I, I feel it with everyone. I feel like, look, the biggest thing to be cr being creative, and, and I've been so lucky, Richard. I've been so creative. All my life has been about creation. And the, art, the, 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 the real secret at the centre is being willing to be a fool. It's just being willing to, to, to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, just put it out there. You know, put it onto the page. You know, just be willing to, or if you're on a stage, say what it is you have to say. And, and if it doesn't work, go, oh, that didn't work and move on. And it's that ability to just not hold yourself back because that tightness prevents that um, intuitive flow of, of inspiration, which is there, which we can tap into. So my, my strong advice is, if you have something to say, be willing to sink back into it just, just as you describe and get it out, and then adopt, then bring in the critic. Okay, where does this work? And if you can do that, like I say, when I'm walking, when I'm philosophy walking, I'm doing both at once. Oh, there it comes, there it comes, and then it's like, oh, let's have a look at that, and then there it comes, there it comes, and I'm just, and it's, and it's, there's a movement between these things. If the critic, if that, that, you know, I'm not good enough. What does that really mean? Oh, that's rubbish. If that comes in too early you prevent yourself ever getting into the ecstatic state of pure creativity. Right. So is perfectionism an enemy in that sense that if, if yes. I'm insisting, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a real perfectionist, but just not at the start. You know, I want it to be as good as it can be, but the way for it to be as good as it possibly can be is to, is not to come in with that at the beginning. It's a bit like um, you were mentioning Michelangelo, earlier if michelangelo had started with his sketch and, and and expected it to look like the ceiling of the mm -hmm. sistine chapel he'd never have done it because he'd be forever going that's not it that's not he did a sketch as a sketch and then he did the thing and that's okay but to finish then the final question i'll ask you how do you finish do you need a deadline or um like where the book has to be sent off to the publisher and that sort of external pressure, but, or would you, if it wasn't for that, would you carry on refining and refining indefinitely? Because I think for people that don't have deadlines, there can be a continuous polishing and a nether of actually coming into a fruition of the, the work. How do, you, how do you find that? Yeah, I, I, I think people do get that. I'm lucky I don't have that. Right. Um, I don't need to work to a deadline. Um, well, it makes me work quicker and makes me feel like I've got to get on with it. Um, I suppose I know when a work's finished and I know when it's not and you know I've only ever been forced to deliver one book I knew wasn't finished and I knew it wasn't finished and we had to do an awful lot of work on it afterwards um, because I was over deadline and it was a hugely ambitious book and it was Jesus and the Goddess actually right. and and I knew I, it wasn't I knew there was further to go with it so I have a real sense of completion that it feels like yeah that's it well, that's that's it's it's not you know it could always be more but that has a that's that's it now what you do if you haven't got that um i think be clearer about what it is you you know because often people don't complete because they don't know quite what they're doing what are they trying to say what are they trying to write what does it look like you can you can never arrive somewhere if you don't know where you're going 
So the not arriving can be that you've not, you know, you haven't managed to achieve it yet, or it can often more likely be you didn't quite know where you were going. And also that our creativity is somewhere about some, you know, creativity in my life has been much about my own life journey as it has been about an end product. You know, I could look back now and I could go, God, I wasted 15 years creating hours of music, which no one will ever hear and probably wasn't good enough in a lot of ways much of it but it doesn't feel like that actually or it does on my bleaker days but no it doesn't that it feels like it feels like no it changed me my soul is different for having gone through all of those states that is who i am so that sometimes we create things for ourselves to go through the experience to be different at the end of it because when we create, it's the closest we get to being like God, if you like, in a mythological sense. You know, we get to we get to be the universe bringing something brand new into the universe. And that's an extraordinary thing, and and something to be really appreciated. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up on that note, Tim. Thank you very much for all that, and um, I feel. Yes, uh, inspired by that. So I hope it's helpful to people out there. Next time, because I always announce it in advance. Uh, oh, by the way, thank you to everyone who commented on the um, the Guru video. It's very interesting comments on the YouTube video linking off to um, sites of the uh, the Miraji, the Guru we were discussing. Um, and next time, I thought we might talk about uh, death and the breathing process. Because, Tim, I know you did some work around that in your... Um, uh, younger years and it's not a period of your life i know much about um so i'd like to ask about how that influenced your later work and philosophy so if anyone has any questions they'd like me to put to tim on that do leave them in the comments on on the video on facebook okay tim thank you very much I'll see thanks you richard